for joining us. Uh, my name is Kevin Anyango, uh, the founder of Mutandao Varsity School of Soft Skills. Uh, the platform uh, talks about th those characteristics or behaviors that employers are looking for. Uh, but today I'm not alone. Today I am with one and only George. George, wake up the show. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, delighted to be here. Well, I've got to say you look very cool. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you you should probably see the lower part of me but all good <laughs> the camera yes, is up we, here yes, yes. We, we all do that well George, you work for irex yourself yes i do and, and actually before talking about irex i was going through uh, your profile linkedin and online yes goodness me yes. what an amazing career you are having <laughs> well it's been a journey it's been a journey one for which i'm deeply grateful for um, it's allowed me different experiences and delighted that I'm here, you know, well, and I'm at IREX at this time. Yeah. And so, so you, you, you lead, uh, I mean, I'm not here to talk about IREX, but I'm talking yes. about you. So you lead IREX Kenya and East Africa. Yeah. And yes, what does do. IREX do? I know when, I, when someone talks about IREX, the first that comes to my yeah. mind is uh, or, or Obama Fellowship. So you guys manage that. <laughs> yes, we do. We manage the Mandela Washington uh, Fellowships. But that's just part of what we do. IREX is a 54-year-old um, um, global development and education organization. Uh, we work across the world and we work in four key areas, um, education being one of them, so access to education and information, a critical part of what the work that we do. We also work on youth development um, as a critical pillar of our work. And also we work on um, building institutions, um, um, so, and, and also on leadership development, which the Mandela Washington Fellowship falls under. So four key areas, um, over 100 countries that we touch with our programming and working yes. in these four different areas. Yes. And, uh, I'll talk about the Obama Foundation, uh, just mm -hmm. for, a, for a sec, really. Well, sorry, the Obama Fellowship. Uh, yes. it's, it's, it, uh, it is a prestigious kind of program. And uh, what's interesting, uh, George, is that mm -hmm. uh, there are still people that believe for you to access those kind of opportunities, you need to know somebody to kind of help you with your application to get you there. Is that the case? Not really, not, not especially for the Mandela Washington Fellowship. Um, it is structured to be very supportive, uh, you know, allowing you to apply. And the process of review is um, completely transparent. Um, there's a, a technical set of reviewers recruited from across the continent that don't even work for IREX and work, you know, on very clear parameters of assessing, um, you know, outcomes and all, and then ensuring that we're getting the right candidates that deserve and that have uh, the potential and promise of future leadership uh, within their communities and within the continent. But yes. not just that, also you find uh, people like Acumen, uh, they've got these kind of programs where, you know, they invite entrepreneurs or whoever to come to their program for mentorship yeah. and, and yes. um, it is frustrating george that mm -hmm. not many people take advantage of this because of the mentality or perception that you know you've got no somebody really so yeah. as a matter of experience yourself can you confirm that you know that's really it's is, is a myth it, it is a myth i mean we are coming from an interesting background so from from our side <laughs> of the fellowship it's a myth um you don't need to know anybody you just need to put your best foot forward and demonstrate, uh, you know, depending on the criteria that we have. But as you say, and um, and, and as I look at the fellowships and, and the scholarships around us, there's usually that notion. And even in my past career, you know, opportunities, I people had that notion that you needed to know somebody to be able to access opportunity. And for work, uh, I think there's there's justified reason, both in Kenya and probably potentially across East Africa, or across Africa that opportunities have been uh, you know dependent on patronage and you know yes. access to powers and all and so you can't uh, completely dismiss <laughs> the fact that there's an element of that however for respectable organizations for the ones yes. that you have mentioned for irex for acumen from uh, the little that i know um i know that these processes are completely above board and are on merit Right, and uh, for those that are joining us, I hope they take uh, this as an encouragement yeah. that you just go for it. You know, you've got nothing to lose. 
or exactly. you could just you know sit down with your ass and do applications because it is it is quite um it's a very engaged application isn't it you, you need it time is. it's not just a one sitting event and I, and i think that's also a problem that we face um <laughs> sometimes people leave the application process probably to the last two or three days yes and you yes. get in and you hurry and you copy and paste you know elements of what you did at each and somewhere yes. and so you haven't taken time to internalize what what is this about what do they require how do i ensure that i'm responding to the various um, elements that they will be assessing when they look at my application and that applies not just for the fellowship, but even for job opportunities. Um, Correct. You know, where, where we receive applications that you, I mean, I've been in situations where somebody has sent for me an application, but it's addressed to a completely different organization. <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. And, and, and I think uh, for those that look for, for opportunities, we, we need to be very careful and also we need to be very serious with not serious, but uh, perhaps attention to details. You know, when you're applying uh, for a particular role, you need to, to know the rules, know what they're looking for. I put myself up there, but yeah. the idea that people think that you know there's a you know there's a notion I need to know somebody that's not their business. For them, if you want an opportunity, go for it. And you're confirming that to me right now. That just go for it, isn't it? Oh yes, please go for it. It is actually for you out there. So you just sort of need to. I mean, acknowledging that it's a competitive process and that you know probably for us a limited number of opportunities with all these cases you sort of need to really set yourself apart as an applicant to really bring out what makes George and why should George be the one to be considered for this opportunity while there are probably four or five other people that may even be better qualified. You know, so what, what is this that, what's the X factor that sets you apart uh, that allows somebody reviewing the application to say, we need this guy in, in our program. What value are they bringing uh, to the program and how do they envision whatever they're getting out of the program impacting their lives going forward. Well, you talk about X factor. So how does young yeah. people show that? Uh, and not just in applications, but even in job opportunities. And I think yeah. this brings me back straight to, uh, to my first question to you mm -hmm. is, yeah, how can young people stand out? You know, what, what's that that employers are looking for? That if they see me, they're like, oh, wow, I want that. Um, good question. Good question. And I think I think um, that preparation ought to start early, you know, and I think that's a disadvantage that we have either probably with our, uh, our formal education systems that <laughs> they're, they're doing a batch training that really um, dumbs down any anybody that's standing that's struggling to stand apart and to sort of set themselves apart because we all need you to go through you know, KCAC and KCPE and, you know, get your grades and go into all these professions. And so we are interested in you looking similar to your neighbor and the other student rather than the things that are setting you apart. I think for me, um, for young people to differentiate themselves, they sort of begin to uh, acknowledge, you know, the capabilities that they have, their interests and their awareness, things that make them a unique human being. Um, and then begin to develop those uh, those things uh, using the opportunities that they have and also begin to document those ones. And I think um, I speak out of experience in terms of, you know, either the opportunities that life has given me and the ones that I seized and the ones that probably I deemed. Uh, but then the totality of those experiences then form me and sort of form the unique George. And so for young people, I think um, they need to take that approach that they begin to start seeing what is it that's uniquely them that the world needs and how does it relate to what the world is searching for. So, you know, I mean, because when we're not growing up, then you're told we need accountants or lawyers or doctors, but then the world is changing. And so, yes, we still need them, but we also have a lot of AI that's beginning to do <laughs> a good chunk of the work. So how then do they set themselves apart and still be useful, you know, and in terms of the skills that they're coming out with, or in terms of just also how they are articulating their difference and their capability. Well, you talk about two things, uh, documenting, you know, what they're good at, and at the same time, trying to use the life experiences when it comes to, to talk about opportunities. Now, so when you talk about life experiences, um, what exactly are you talking about here? And uh, the reason I'm asking this is for those people that are struggling to look for opportunities. You know, they are fresh from, uh, from college 
uh, you know, mm -hmm. am amazing, amazing degree, fantastic degree, amazing. Um, we use, we call them um, GPAs, like, you know, good yes. grades. But yeah. you hear somebody take six, seven years to get even the internship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so a couple of things, there are, there are internal factors um, from my experience and my understanding, and there are also external factors that we have to contend with. Um, internally, you, you know, brilliant, you go through school, and, and for some people, they really, really go through school. And unlike some of us that, you know, went sort of passed through school, there were people that really got themselves studying, got themselves really serious to get the most out of the academic side of it. Um, my understanding, and ultimately they get out and they're brilliantly, um, you know, academically endowed, uh, but probably less endowed on other, you know, social or or emotional or other characteristics that are also equally important to finding opportunity to engaging with people and ultimately to finding employment as one major one a second one of course that i know is and i remember experiencing it <laughs> and i was laughing at myself and saying sometimes also and i don't encourage anybody to not be the top scorer that they should be but i think for some of us that were not coming at the top of the class especially in you know in, in undergrad and all you get out with the vigor to you know prove yourself and to get something happening and i remember either a couple of classmates that were you know top top scholars and were coming out but really coming into the job industry and coming with the notion that the industry owes them out of that you know sterling academic performance and so i remember you know colleagues that either were being getting opportunities in really good companies but being started at the lowest level and being started on work that they felt was beneath them <laughs> and and completely missed the point that they needed to understand the totality of that business to be able to then really function and to then be able to grow so i think that's also a problem that you face that some people then excel you know i got a first class degree um yes. and so there are things that i can't do <laughs> or I got a degree in X and so that's left for the people that got degrees in Y and they come out and they spend a year you know really searching for this ideal opportunity so that's the internal more um, intrinsic side of it the external forces for me uh you know what what the market structures and sort of just the opportunity or lack thereof so we acknowledge of course that um, you know there are more people coming into the workforce anywhere mostly especially but more prominently in africa and in kenya for that matter than we are creating jobs and particularly jobs in the formal sector a pretty small portion of it and so all these people coming out are competing <laughs> for this opportunity so the system in that sense is not enabling we're not creating the jobs as fast as we should to provide opportunity for young people that are coming into the market and then also, of course, as we talk, sometimes I'm coming out with my training, which painfully sometimes was pretty theoretical. I went to a science yeah. university. I came out with training that was super theoretical. Some of my friends would probably disagree. Coming into a world that was, you know, we were using equipment that was for yesteryears, coming into a world that had moved to be digital um, and, and completely finding that our skills were not relevant or not not necessarily even relevant for the opportunities that were there i was coming from a science school being trained in natural sciences and then coming out and most of my classmates were getting into marketing and there was not even a single marketing <laughs> unit as part of our four-year training at university and so you get out and you're like your medical representative you have to completely unlearn a lot of your chemistry <laughs> yes and botany and pick uh, to begin to understand how to convince a doctor to prescribe your drugs yet the the university did not prepare you so you brilliantly understand the chemical compositions of the drugs that you're trying to sell but these guys are searching for your skills to sell it rather than to yeah. naturally just interpret it you know yeah that's that's interesting so john so are we saying that at the moment or in this generation my generation maybe uh, yeah. we are self and uh, there's that kind of entitlement like you know like i'm coming up i'm coming out of university i need a mm -hmm. job government give me a job is that mm -hmm. kind of mentality and should we blame young mm -hmm. people like like you know it's their fault 
Um, it's it, it's a shared blame, for lack of a better word, and I really don't like using the word blame, but I think it's a shared blame between government and between uh, between the young people themselves. One thing I believe is that if you're waiting <laughs> for your first job experience to happen after university, you're too late. <laughs> And, and, and why do I say that? Because then you find that there are people that either were in between, um, you know, breaks between the transition from university to, no, sorry, from, from secondary school to university were already doing things, selling at their mother's shop or, or working in a tea plantation like I did. <laughs> um, that that then by the time you're coming in, you sort of have elements of this is how the workplace is. You know, <laughs> either you are volunteer at a place X and also through the time that you're going through university. If you're dedicatedly just on your academics and following your university program 100%, and it doesn't have opportunities for internships and all, then, then you're getting into the market completely unprepared and a little too late. <laughs> I believe, and I believe that proper programs, and if it's not there in your university that you need to search for opportunity to volunteer, just to allow you to then experience how the workplace works and to begin to deal with what is required of an employee. And so young people really focusing to excel in their academics and not learning any other thing in trying to translate the academic skill or the academic theory or the academic practical into real life context are getting in a little unprepared. However, the same government also needs to be focusing you know, where, do, where are they investing? What opportunities are they creating? How do they ensure that uh, the education system is speaking to real world context? And how is it interfacing with industry? How is it interfacing with where these young people ought to go and begin to then support those linkages while also understanding how, you know, labor trends and what's changing, both to ensure that that's inculcated or rather infused into the curriculum that young people are going through um, in that tertiary education stage, um, as then you prepare them to come out. So they have a responsibility, I mean, and it will not go away mm -hmm. of creating opportunity for employment. And, and I think I need to clarify the notion also that employment ought to just be formal, <laughs> that they need to create space for young people that want to come and experiment, that want to come and be entrepreneurs, to have the infrastructure that supports them to set up a business, that supports them to to understand that because what we're also finding out even you know from my work perspective is that uh, there's this false narrative of transition that you get out of university you get a white collar job yes <laughs> or pink or pink collar um, yes. and then you transition straight you know into you know get in and get your first paycheck and all and it's a very small percentage of young people that that happens to majority of them then get out with that narrative with that notion and find that those jobs are not there and so they stay and the pressure is there that you also went to university or to college yes. and performed very well yes. and so all your peers either are doing well or doing things or the guys that stopped at secondary school and went straight into business probably on several businesses or several matatus and yes. <laughs> are really doing very well and you are here with your education and you still don't have opportunity. So just also the acknowledgement that, especially for economies like ours, the informal sector will still count heavily for opportunities for young people to get employed. And so it is the responsibility of government to ensure that that sector thrives, that there's an enabling environment, and that ultimately there's also a sequence of the um, non, what do you call non-formal or informal sector transitioning to be formal. So if I start my business, you know, slowly I have opportunities to register and probably to uh, find capital and grow it. Yeah, so it's so, a double. Uh, that's interesting. How uh, just for me to just to deviate a bit. You look very nice, cool, and collected. Is that because of experience, or is that that's who you are? I'm always a for the TV. <laughs> I well I didn't know that I've come and collected so really happy to hear. No, 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 you are. But, no, no, but, no, no, but, you are. <laughs> no, no, thank you, thank you very much. I think it's just um it's 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 my nature and especially when it's a conversation that I'm, I enjoy and especially a conversation around 
young people, which you know has been a significant part of my life and part of my working life. Um, so, um, but both yeah. don't listen. But uh, both, you see, I, I've I've got this theory or this this school of thought that mm -hmm. you are as good as your boss. You know, it doesn't matter what you have, but if your yeah. boss doesn't give you opportunity, you to go far. Now, yeah. you see that space where you employ people. You know, you need mm -hmm. a massive group of people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, as a boss or a line manager, how do you make sure that you know you nurture young people and at the same time also, you know, you make them be accountable in what they are doing? I suppose yeah. what I'm trying to ask is, how can young people compete mm -hmm. in employment? Um, so, so, so I think I think there is the place for your boss um, in your growth. And, and there is a story that people don't quit organizations, they quit bosses. <laughs> um, and so, so, so for sure, there's an element of how your boss enables you. And this is, this is quite interesting because my former boss at the British Council, you know, saw this on, on LinkedIn and, and was commenting and saying, why are you guys just focusing on bosses? We do our part. Um, <laughs> and I was laughing and, and saying, you know, no, it wasn't my idea to put the boss in. But but I think I think it's important. There is a, there's a significant element um, and of a role that the boss plays, and people that are lucky get good bosses. You know, for lack of a better word, good bosses that give you the space, uh, you know, to grow, give you the space, especially for young people to make mistakes. You know, because 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 that's the, the the avenue for growth. Uh, so even choosing where you're going to work hopefully you can't choose your boss directly but choosing the places that you're going to work you need to sort of look at that organizational culture and see however even bad organizations in quotes usually teach you quite a lot correct <laughs> they teach correct. you resilience they teach you you know all all that you need um <laughs> to 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 get into the workplace to learn to deal with different people and different issues but there is an element of the boss and how they enable you, you know, by either opening opportunity, by correcting you, by allowing you to make mistakes, and by being on your side. And also sometimes you need to be shielded by them standing on the way and receiving the flack on your behalf. Um, and, 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 and let me say half the people get that lucky, the other half don't. They just get bosses that throw you onto the rail tracks. And, yes. and every time you have to pick yourself and run. However, having said that the bosses have a responsibility for your growth, I don't think that your uh, professional development rests on somebody else. It rests on you, um, the ambitions and the aspirations that you have for your work and for your future, and just what you're doing to ensure that you are that person, either for what you're doing or for the future that you want. And that counts in terms of how much time am I spending here uh, within this opportunity? How much time am I spending waiting for opportunity? Is there something else that I can do? Is there any way that within that opportunity I can learn? As we know that 70% of learning happens on the job. Correct. How then do I seize the opportunity to learn, to experience new things? How do I take hard things at work? Because you find also people settle to do the, the comfortable thing and not to stretch themselves to other things. So in terms of professional growth for young people, it's in your hands. And I've witnessed it myself in a way that um, as, as a leader, sometimes you will burden the guy that you know will get it done <laughs> with yes. three things and completely avoid the other guy that will give you excuses when you give him that assignment. So in terms of, so there's, a, there's an element of character, there's an element of really being proactive and going for it. And also there's just an element of, you know, being clear about how you want to grow and where you want to do. And what opportunities then do you seize so that you immediately see, I'm not making any progress in this place. I need to leave. <laughs> and is that, you is that usually, uh, it's leaving usually uh, uh, the solution. And, and listen, I've got lots of friends that mm -hmm. don't actually spend a year uh, within a particular company. Now, I am employed myself and I've been there uh, now, this is my seventh year now. And I can tell you, George, uh, the, the turnover of young people is ridiculous, you know? So uh, is that lack of patience or the environment is just always toxic for young people? Um, I think, I think we're sort of also coming from two generations. So 
so so so so there is um there's a level of patience with clarity of what you want and what you want to learn that that allows you to see um you know what you're doing if if, if you are at a place and you're learning nothing new and you'll know that you're learning nothing new you have either hit the ceiling or or there's a complete blockade that's not allowing you to learn then you need to do your calculations and move um i am aware that we are getting into a sort of a new phase of a new generation of the workforce that work in very different terms and i think probably those are the ones that you're experiencing at your place they they don't i mean if i remember my parents it was you get into one place and work till you retire correct <laughs> and yes. then came our time you know that then you do 10 years or, or you know i mean it, it, you were frowned upon with that movement all the time i and i still frown upon you know like over the past uh, four years you have moved to four or five jobs what exactly are you searching for do you really know what you want or do you have the patience? Because when you once you come in, there was something definitely that you're coming into the company. How quickly have you done it in a way that allows you to leave in the next eight months? Or is it not working? And is, if it's not working, is it that you can't adjust to be able to develop the skill to deal with it or to grow into whatever and to just learn from it? So there's a balance between people that also just settle and get very comfortable at one place and also the people that are always just jumping <laughs> out of one opportunity to another um which also for me then triggers gives me a sense of you know that 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 are they do, are they do they first know what they're searching for and do they also understand that you know work is not entertainment per se you you need to enjoy it but there are elements that you may not enjoy and you need to use those elements to grow you. And sometimes people run away from being stretched, you know, mm -hmm. but the people that I know that have become really good employees were people that went through either that ringing through the wire <laughs> to refine or bring out the skills that they didn't even know they had. And, so, and that, that takes patience. So sometimes leaving is not the solution for you. No, no, <laughs> no. Um, Again, for those that are just joining us, uh, my name is Kevin Anyango. I'm speaking to George uh, of IREX, uh, the platform to allow varsity school of soft skills. And the platform talks about uh, those behaviors or characteristics that employers are looking for. Now, last segment of this conversation, George, uh, I'm going to mm. ask you about sexual exploitation. You know, you read mm -hmm. stories of, you know, of young people coming to an environment of work, mm -hmm. they've given mm -hmm. opportunity, and yeah. then uh, for them to progress, there's that element, actually not just sexual exploitation to get with men as well, and even mm -hmm. racism. So you as a boss, yes. you know, yeah. Yeah. what will you tell that young person that has just joined Rx, um, mm. and within a year they want to proceed, or they want, uh, they, want, mm. they want to kind of to climb the ladder. And mm -hmm. someone is saying, unless you sleep with me, I want to give you that opportunity. How do you address that in the workplace? That's number one. And number two, what should young people do when those kind of uh, experiences uh, come to them? Really, really good question. And uh, I mean, so, so taking the context, I'll take two contexts of it. One is a context where, you know, an organization is either probably small or so started and doesn't have those policies. So that's, that's, that's a very clear one in, a, in literally most of the organizations that I've worked for, including the one that I founded. Um, <laughs> And, and we had to tackle that really early on. Um, so, so it should not be a matter of, of uh, what would I call it? It should not be a matter of guesswork. It should be well articulated in policy and, and opportunities for reporting, which is, which is characteristic of where I work now at IREX, that we're very clear about um, you know, sexual harassment, conflict of interest, and any other things that would stand in your way or make it awkward or also you know, expose me as a leader, because when you don't have those systems, actually both sides suffer. <laughs> there is a potential of me being blamed to have made an, a pass at you. Um, um, and, 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 and I did, you know, it was either some conversation that was misrepresented because there are no boundaries, there are no guidelines for what you need to do and not do within the workplace. So the first thing, of course, is, you know, for organizations must, I mean, it's not optional 
have very clear policies around these types of issues about around sexual harassment around exploitation both um, you know internally looking at staff to staff staff to consultants and also externally looking to beneficiaries that we work with because uh, the projects that we have give us power you know over either communities that you work with and i experienced that from you know my first couple of months working back when i got into into the employment field in in the year 2000 sorry so it's been 20 22 years <laughs> you quite young for that yeah yeah so and i got into that and you could you you could you, you saw the power that it gave you and especially as a young person then getting into work that you're working with communities and people see you as a person that's holding the past strings and all now in organizations and in, in in an irex type of organization that is so well stipulated you have reporting mechanisms and and it doesn't stop you know i mean it's reporting mechanism to out of the organization if need be and so um when people come in, in in as part of our own boarding that is made very clearly if young people come in that should be very clear that if this if somebody makes a pass your boss who whatever this is how you deal with it and these are the, the channels and the processes of raising a com concern and a complaint and it will be investigated and ultimately you know a decision is made but for young people coming in so they need to one um, you know, find these mechanisms early in advance when they're getting into the organization um, to, to ensure that, you know, they are not exposed when they get in. So probably even doing your own research as you're trying to join an organization to just figure out do they have relevant policies that safeguard you and how is safeguarding at the heart of it. You mentioned an interesting one that's also been, you know, a major part, which is racism or the notion of racism, especially in our development sector. And that's one um, that sometimes manifests pretty subtly. And, and I think, um, you know, organizations, IREX included, have now have really defined policies. Of course, any, any form of discrimination is forbidden, but you find that, you know, there are subtle ways that, that, that are neither here nor there. And I think organizations that are cautious, especially like where I work now, have actually come very clearly to recognize these elements of you know, discrimination that can play in the workplace. So for me, it's policy, policy, policy for young people, even as they are getting into these organizations, to see that does this organization really safeguard me as an employee and what are my paths for redress? Should I feel that I'm not safe or should I feel that there's some, something that's happening to me one opportunity that has, I'm being denied based on something, either because I haven't yielded. And, and it happens quite significantly. And you've mm. seen, you know, in a number of even, you know, very <laughs> open cases that have happened uh, in oh, the yes. development. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, I, mean I, can, I can name them myself. You know, obviously, yeah. from here, uh, we travel yes. because of that. Um, yeah. So, but if you are, George, if you are desperate, and this is your first job, you know, mm -hmm. a very young guy, you know, you hustled your way and here you are now in a very nice organization. And then uh, your boss uh, you know, is, is, is suggesting uh, to you. Yeah. You know, they've, they've got to know the mechanism how to protect victims, not victims, to, to protect, uh, yes, well, those people that mm -hmm. might experience this kind of stuff. So you know, I know you're talking about policy to policy, but for young people themselves, uh, should they be aware of this before the general organization? Should they ask this through the interview? I mean, how does the discussion start before it happens? Um, I think it's uh, it's definitely a discussion that starts at your own boarding. So while you may not ask it on the interview, I think um, young people would have to, and I know desperation sometimes allows us to take abuse and say, I'm doing it for, 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 for this opportunity or for my people or something. But I think young people need to interrogate an organization, you know, by the time, because interviews are actually a two way process for you to understand what the organization is up to and for the organizations also to judge whether you fit. So you in that interview process, you can begin to learn the culture and begin to take notes of, of, of what's happening in that sense um, in that organization and whether you align with it, but also even pre interview you would have looked through you know this organization and what they put out as their values and all and you can interrogate that if you want during the interview 
However, at the point of onboarding where you've been given an offer and you're now being introduced to these things, if they're explicitly not written out and you cannot see that should I face such, I have this, this mechanism, that the staff handbook is ambiguous or is vague on this one, then it's a time to raise it. One, of course, because you may be joining an organization that hasn't given it that deep thought. They may not be a bad organization, they're just probably inexperienced. And so it could be even be an opportunity to add value uh, to that organization by telling them you need to address uh, these critical issues. Or it will then flag to you that these people are not keen on mm -hmm. taking this approach, you know, and, and that begins to allow you to ensure how you safeguard or what sort of you know mechanisms because what usually like you tell people because sometimes these things are like oh, where's where's the evidence and all yes is to find your own ways to document what's happening in a way that then you can release it later while it's not legal to re record people you know in your conversations if you begin to feel that you are safe then you need to find mechanisms of either a third party you know, coming into these conversations and uh -huh. beginning to be your witness in that sense. Yeah. Well, you're very, you're very good with words, George, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> but that's explains <laughs> why you've done very well. Look, mm -hmm. uh, my last question for me, uh, mental health challenges. Um, yes. You know, you find, especially even uh, during COVID time, uh, yeah. where there are lots of young people coming out of colleges and, you know, wanting to go to employment, but then boom, uh, there were these disruptions are caused mm -hmm. uh, by, by COVID. Mm -hmm. Should workplace have got a mechanism of supporting uh, staff that are going through a lot? Or is that, it's your business? You know, you come to work for me. I want you to make me money. I want you uh, mm -hmm. to achieve my mm -hmm. vision. I don't care about yeah. your mental health. That is you at home, say with it. Um, so, so mental health, you know, definitely is gaining prominence and taking its rightful place. You see, when you have a physical ailment, it's easy to see, <laughs> you know, and so it's easy to then allow you to go to hospital and all. And in many workplaces, um, mental health had never been counted as something important and something to be safeguarded. Uh, organizations for now have come to that realization that it's equally important to cut the liver when you're not fine mentally and that there needs to be a structure of mental health and mental health support. Now, uh, both for people that would need it just periodically or for people that um, are living with, with a mental uh, issue. Um, and, and, and I've been, uh, you know, in, in spaces where that, that has happened, where I either I have a colleague um, and, and in terms of equal opportunity, you see, see it's interesting, like, would, uh, would I deny somebody um, a role to deny it on the basis that they suffer from, you know, a mental condition? <laughs> uh, or and, and, and how ready are organizations to accommodate that sometimes inconvenience as they may see it. Um, but I've known and I've noted, and especially this has come to the fore during this period, during um, even for us, people that are working, that you are working from home forever, you know, against all these four walls <laughs> and not meeting many people over that time. And it just gets to you. So how do you ensure, how do you structure, and, and, and for, for, for some of us, of course, so, you know, the organization then designed how to ensure that people are connecting and that as much as those connections may have been virtual and also just being cautious about, you need to take a break, you need to stop working at this time and all. And for young people, it's even been heavier, you know, guys that were hanging with their friends every day, and now all of a sudden can't meet, you're going to university, you can't. You are getting out of university very excited about the workplace and all of a sudden there are no jobs, you know, companies are closing and all. So that mental issue that IREX has put um, a significant focus on it, even for young people. I think we've had as part of uh, our Youth Excel Global Program that uh, uh, USAID supports, um, that we have supported young people's organizations that are addressing mental health challenges for young people across, across, across the region in a couple of countries um, in Eastern and Southern Africa. And it is becoming just as prominent as mm. if I had some form of, you know, other challenge or issues that I needed to deal with that was not mental. Well, it's, it's good to know that. And as I say, you know, it's not your fault when you have this kind of uh, event exactly. that's happening. Um, 
John, before I let you go, is mentorship overrated? <laughs> mentorship is, is a not overrated one bit. Um, I think even if you if you sort of look at at life and look at even you know early days um and and i'm i was fascinated by the british medical training system um and i had an opportunity of running a program with you know the royal college of physicians and watched their 500 year history of how education training how medical training was an apprenticeship approach you know, so a doctor wasn't a classroom thing. It was you working with a senior doctor and learning the trade from them and them then saying you're now certified to be a doctor. And over time, well, I'm simplifying it, but <laughs> but basically that, that, that was the journey that you get in and it's more of you doing and learning and being supported and being guided by somebody that has done it for you. And even for you, Kevin, you would probably know that some of the best mechanics that we had, you know, when you're still in Kenya, were mechanics that learned from somebody. <laughs> Correct. You know, that had yes. a mentor that had that were an apprentice for a really good mechanic um, and learned in that sense. I think mentorship allows you to see where you haven't been um, as a young person. And so I feel it's it's a really, really important um, space and opportunity for young people to learn, to learn from people that are either went ahead of them failed and have learned what works and probably what is that doesn't work but also just allows also a two-way challenge because uh, the, the person that you mentor you know probably did it in a different generation uh, or, or, or let's say your mentor is is from a different generation so they went through an experience when it was those days of so many vagina after you yes. finish school you'll get a job and you are now living in a world that that is completely not true and so there's all that reverse mentoring that happens as well, and that they learn from you what's happening in this current world, but bring their wisdom of experience into that conversation to give you different perspectives of how you can approach your life. So but for me, mentor, mentorship, yeah. But with your experience, do you mm -hmm. mentor people? I mean, uh, people like you, it's very hard to find in the public. And uh, that is my frustration, <laughs> uh, George, as I tell you now. Uh, these yeah. big organizations, you know, uh, in our country, yeah. in Kenya, wherever, there mm -hmm. are lots of senior managers like you, but we don't see you in public. So it's very hard to motivate that young young girl from wherever village. Say, like, you know what? Yeah. If George can yeah. do it, even my brother can do it. So yeah. why, why don't I see these, uh, these faces? Like, why don't you see your face, George, on the newspapers and stuff? <laughs> well, 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 I think, I think probably those platforms. I mean, more, the more visible platforms may not be available, but I also believe that with the sphere of influence that we have, you know, my interactions, my relationships, either my schools, my former places that believe that I have something to say, reach out and say, can you come and speak to this group? But also there are also people that have come to me personally and said, I'd love to walk alongside you and, you know, especially in this development space and learn from you the things that you've done. And so we open that window and then you take them by the hand. But the mentorship journey is also a really active journey. So you can't, you, you, I mean, and people are busy, so you have to pursue me as well. Ensure yes. that we have a structured process that I'm. I, I pursued you, George. For all, for all yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Nazima Nichom. We've got <laughs> viewers to know. And, and it's important, yeah. George. People are busy. Yeah. That's true. But at the same yeah. time, George, we've got to take responsibility as well. Yes, of course. And, you know, because no, completely. This, the, 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 the social platforms, are, you know, yes. what internet is giving us now is giving an mm -hmm. opportunity to reach people like you. But as you say, yes. people are busy. So what? What's the, what's the solution then? I mean, I think, I think people also, and it depends on individuals as well. So I have friends of mine that are committed mentors, you know, they go back to their school. I like to shout out to my former HR director when I worked at the British Council that has taken mentorship. I mean, he's always back to his high school and he's always Who posting that, stuff George? about mentorship. Um, it's a gentleman <laughs> called Paul Ngugi, right. uh, who is superbly, uh, you know, passionate about mentorship and talks about it every time. Uh, on every platform that he has. For me, and, and it's something that I tried to do before I got really busy, was to begin to document my journey 
um, you know, over the past 20 or so years. And what key lessons I picked, you know, giving to guys either that were studying new organizations or getting into this profession, or just the experiences that I had mentoring, you know, people that were young who are now, you know, in, in contributing you know, to society in, in, in significant positions and just the journey that we had with them. Um, and this is something that has been very close to my heart. When I ran Youth Alive Kenya, yes. we had a very clear mentorship undergrad internship program that generated most of the people that we had that became employees and who now work, um, you know, everywhere around the world. And, and we were very intentional about that journey, about allowing them to make mistakes, but about allowing them also to go out to the world using the platform of the organization. And, and, and so I think now for me, the mentorship ought to reach a wider audience, an opportunity like this is critical, but also me penning down my experiences. Uh, and I did a serialization, I think four part series of that journey and somebody reached out to me and said, you should put this on a book. So hopefully sure, sometime George. I will. <laughs> no, no, serious. I think those kind of, and again, I mean, listen, we can yeah. spend the whole day here talking about this yeah. kind of stuff, which are very yeah. relevant. Uh, but for the, for the sake of time, um, mm. uh, I think it is important, you know, for us to document yeah. this kind of stuff and even let people read. You know, we've got from this reading culture, because again, when you read, you know more, isn't it? Yes, and when you read, exactly. you build that confidence and, and, and you learn from people. Um, yeah. John, before I let you go, I don't want to ask my guest, to introduce me to the next person. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I don't know whether you to mention names now here or should I go to the DM? I, th I think uh, I'd have to because I'd have to think and <laughs> and try and just names. feel. I just have names which I know they're, they're your peers. Okay. Okay. So, so that would have... we'd have we'd have to DM and then okay. I can help you say let's go to this guy. Right. <laughs> and and, and you, are, you are telling the world that you're yeah. going to reply to that DM, right? I will tell you. <laughs> I, I shall <laughs> reply to the DM. <laughs> uh, well, listen, John, I cannot thank you enough for your time. And uh, clearly, there are some that you mentioned here. I wish I knew them when I was, I was growing up. You know, there are things that yeah. not many people have the opportunity to learn mm -hmm. from, for example, things like, you know, employers should allow young people to make mistakes and learn from it. Oh, um, yes. You know, we all go through these kind of challenges that, if we don't know how to tackle them, you know, we end up uh, in either depression or losing a career. Uh, yeah. So learn, learning from you guys with experience is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, for those that have, have been with us, uh, this is the University School of Soft Skills. I was talking to George Ogola, uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya, works for IELTS. George, thanks for speaking to me. I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much, Kevin, for having me. I hope that I've, I've shared my tidbits. Oh, this one amazing. I'll come for work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank Bye you very now. much. <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>